Hello folks, thank you for joining me and welcome back to the channel. You are always most welcome here, as ever. Well, today is my last episode in my Matchbox March celebration of 50 years of Matchbox kits. And I have to say, uh, the videos have been a lot more popular. I thought, I, sometimes I think I'm just talking to myself, but clearly that is not the case. Um, some of these videos have been incredibly popular and I've never had so many comments, really. You know, I seem to get more comments per video every day and there's so many people, so many of you, who have contributed and actually made this possible. Several of the kits that have been featured in the month have come from you guys. I've um, got quite a few of my own, obviously. It's just a tiny selection here in the background. Not selected for particular reasons, but we'll get to that later. Um, but I think it's been um, quite revealing just how much uh, I am not alone in just the passion that a lot of us have for these, these old kits. And of course we had a little bit of dabbling to some of the old Airfix ones as well while we're at it. But I think it's important to try and, to try and put... Uh, anybody that's watching this that's never made models or isn't interested in models and maybe you've wandered in by accident, and you were thinking, good grief, what's this guy on about? Oh my god, how boring, you know, what a geek. But the reality is, it's not just about plastic kits and making plastic models. What this channel is about, and what this particular series this month has been about, really, is about, it's about nostalgia. And taking you back to an earlier, perhaps simpler, happier time. Um, and the world didn't seem to have quite so many problems that, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it because when these kits came out, we were in the middle of the, the Cold War and the threat of you know, uh, world conflict was no uh, less than it is today. Uh, although today it feels like it's very imminent at times, but anyway, we won't get into any of that. But generally the world seems simpler, you know, things were easier to understand, people were not spending as much of their energy on what seems to me to be ridiculous things today. Um, you know, trying to rewrite the past, rewriting history, you know. And we had a, a discussion about this several times, of course, when we talk about you know, unpopular regimes, you know, like the Nazis example, uh, and others, uh, where things are Japanese as well, um, in World War II when, when these regimes were not, not good regimes and, and anyway, were defeated, so that's all by the by, but uh, nowadays we seem to want to, we seem to want to have this thing where we're trying to rewrite history and revise things, put our own morality on, on what happened 100, 200, 300 years ago, or whatever. We can't do that, you know, history is just set in stone. History is what it is, yeah? It is what it is. Uh, so I get quite cross when I see companies that won't put swastikas in kits that had a swastika on it. I mean, the ME109, you know, both of them have got it. Uh, this is before, I mean, I don't know how that worked in Germany because a lot of the younger Germans, uh, we have a couple of German um, subscribers who follow us. Jokel is German, he's a regular enthusiastic subscriber on our live chat. Um, and he says, oh, it's, it's illegal to have it in Germany. Well, I, I don't really understand this because did these kits not appear in Germany then? Because I don't believe that somehow. But anyway, perhaps you can tell me, did, did they not appear because they had a swastika on when they came out? Because I think you'll find that it's been, this revisionism has crept in, trying to airbrush away history. And I think that this is more of a recent thing toward the end of the 20th century. But anyway, please let me know because I'd like to know for sure. But I digress. So really what this is about, it's about looking back at, at some of these old kits and I was thinking I'm going to make a short list of which are the best kits. Well that's just ridiculous and as soon as I sat down and thought about it I thought well that's crazy because I, I've, I've not had every Matchbox kit or I haven't seen every Matchbox kit. I've only seen about probably two thirds to three quarters. I own about half of them. Not, not in the whole world, I mean just half of the range. You know. <laughs> If only that were true. <laughs> Boy, would my prices be something else you want to buy one. <sighs> Calm down, you're not a Bond villain. <sighs> anyway, but yeah, I, I say you can't actually put, you can't really um, quantify it anyway, I don't think, uh, in terms of within their range. I have to say that of, of all the kits I've seen, I think the best one I've seen so far Probably that Lysander, the big Lysander that goes with the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt here in the 132 range. I was surprised how good that was. I was really impressed by that one. But um, as I say, you can't really be sure. You can't put a figure on it or say this is the absolute best. So I decided not to do that. I thought what we we'll just do is talk about our own favourites. Our own favourites. And they can be for entirely your own reasons. Doesn't matter, frankly. 
your reasons can be your own. It could be a happy memory or a holiday or a girlfriend or a family member or a party you were at or whatever it was. You know, it can be millions and millions of reasons or something you built with your dad or your mum. You know, we have lots and lots of reasons why some of these things stick in the memory, especially when we were younger. So I'm just going to reel a few of mine off and uh, there's no big story behind them particularly anyway. Just the ones that I sort of gave me a warm feeling when I got them, you know. And it's very hard even then. There's so many. There's so many. Every one, when I see the image, it's almost like a photographic memory. I, instantly there is a snapshot in my mind and I bet you're the same. I see that image and instantly I have this snapshot of the village green, little village I used to live in, tiny village in Suffolk. And I used to play on the village green, and it was small, uh, with a friend of mine called Philip, and he got one of these, and he did his in the American colours, the AV8A, and I did mine in the British colours, and we sort of had this NATO operation going with our tanks. It was great fun, and took him to school as well, you know. And I broke, I think I broke the first one, so my dad bought me another one. So instantly, you have these memories come straight back, you know. And, and it, the it's, same is true with all of them, so with the Firefly, bang! takes me back to a few, about three, four years, three years later. Uh, we've moved house and we're living in Cumbria on the coast and there used to be this little model shop called FN Fiddler. There's a chap called Frank Fiddler who used to run it and his wife ran one half of the shop. She did all the handicrafts and the wool and the crocheting, which my mum loved, I'm a sister. And I loved all the other stuff. And my dad liked the DIY and I liked all the model kits and it was mainly Matchbox that he did. And... Uh, and this came out and he had it in the window when it first came out. So I think that was 76, was it? Let's get a check for you. Oh no, it says 73 here. We moved there in 75. So that really tells you. I didn't see that for two years for some reason. Perhaps my local, uh, when I was in Suffolk, my local post office obviously didn't have it for sale. And they did have strange, they only had certain parts of the range that I want. But last, the first time I saw that was when I got, ironically, to a place that had a beach on the coast. And it seemed very appropriate because this thing is coming up the beach. So that's got a happy memory, thinking about the beach. Straight away, you know. Um, this one, the Corsair. One of my favourites, you know, um, mainly because I love the artwork. And again, I've tried to sort of, in my own mind, trying to separate the artwork from the actual kit. But I, find, I don't know about you, but I find this very, very hard because it's almost part of the fingerprint of the kit so much with these. I mean look at this one. This is one of my all-time favourite artworks on almost any kit to be honest. It's right up there. It just, you know, I knew nothing about the Corsair. I didn't know much about Vietnam, in, so even in 75. Um, and I saw this and I thought what an incredible piece of art. And you know it's got the nice sort of uh, graphics on the back and it's clearly got lots and lots of bombs on it which you know, ten-year-old boys were really um, very excited by ordnance. Rightly or wrongly, I'm not sure I'm excited by it. I see it on TV at the moment, but anyway. Um, just an exciting, dramatic scene hooked me immediately and I wanted to have a Corsair. And, in the case of the Corsair, please balance, of course I built it, didn't do any uh, painting, this is not the actual original one from August 75, but it's identical. I actually emulated my own attempt, if you know what I mean. So here we have it, with its many, many, many bombs. Look at them. There's a lot of bombs there. Look at that lot. No messing about. So there we go. But the reason it sticks in my memory so greatly is because... Um, we were actually moving, when I mentioned about moving to Cumbria, to the coast, this was between, so I had this between that and the tank, and we were in a caravan for a month, uh, sort of holiday stroke interim measures, while our house was trying to sell uh, in Suffolk, and, and it, it, the sale fell through, so we had to go back. So we had a month anyway in this caravan, and I sat there for about a week building this, and it, again, strongly imprints into your mind, doesn't it, these memories of... In this case, it was being in the caravan, quite a lot of rainy days. <laughs> um, my sister moaning, she was bored, you know, and I said, well, why don't you make a model then? Oh, stupid boy stuff, she used to say. <laughs> but it, and this again was on the beach, a place called Sylecroft on a beach, with a mountain behind and on a beach in front. It was, and on the nice days, my mum and dad bought us uh, kites. We used to fly kites on the beach and then my sister was happy then, you know. 
And this was great fun. I was very bad at kite flying, I've got to be honest. I remember just being a bit of a disaster, so maybe I should have just stuck to the models. <laughs> but again, it's there. It's, it's you know, me running around in short trousers, with getting glue all over the caravan. And I, I definitely wasn't allowed to use paint. That was no, that was a no no because they knew I'd get it all over the seats. And so I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to paint it anyway. But there you go, so that's uh, there's a couple of my favourites. Also, um, we've got the Spitfire, and th these came out later in 77, I think these came out, 76, 77. Again, same similar memories to this one about the, the little model shop in the village on the beach, near the beach. Um, really good fun, enjoyed, and actually um, built the 109E and made a, my first ever diorama. I haven't done many. <laughs> I did, did it on a diorama, crash landed, and put it on a base and everything. Crash landed with its propellers bent back. And it looked pretty good, you know, for a, for the work of a 10, 11 year old. It was all right, you know, and I, I showed it to the, the shop owner, Frank Fiddler, Mr Fiddler. And he said, Peter, that's so good, please can I put it in the window? <laughs> so he was a friend for life. You know, I think I was one of his best customers, that's probably why. He was trying to butter me up. But he had it in the window for about um, two weeks, I think. And, uh, and then I said, can I have it back? <laughs> and he said, yes, that's fine, because I've got some new stock coming in. So... Again, it made me a bit of a celebrity in the village, that, because this, oh, it's, you did that, it's very good, you know, and became a bit of a celeb, not quite Phil Flory or whatever, you know, but, but uh, or Night Shift or whoever, but you know, it just raises your profile and people realise that you're, you're, uh, you've got a worthwhile hobby, really, you know. Um, others that were quite striking as well, um, this is a second one that reminds me of my, um, <laughs> The Mark I Hurricane, it's in the Mark I lift-off box, this one as well, it's a real Mark I, complete with um, the graphics there. I've got the wrong way around, don't I? it should be that way around. It's, of course it's got the, uh, as you know, it's got the dog dirt brown plastic. <laughs> not sure if I should say that. <clears throat> but this has got memories from that time as well, when I was in the caravan as a child. And, you know, again, this wonderful Roy Huxley artwork, Dusk Raid on the uh, the airbase at Khan, Carpi K airbase. Uh, now it's an airfield, it's an airport now, of course, but uh, the Germans had it and uh, over in Normandy, and this is the hurricane swooping in. Uh, it doesn't say the year, but it's probably 1943 44, I imagine. And I built that at the time as well, you know. And I've only got to see the plastic from that, and instantly I remember the artwork, I remember where I was. It's almost like people say, we all remember where we were when we heard about JFK being shot while I wasn't that old. So I don't remember that, obviously, but I know what they mean. You know, 9-11, these... But for me, <laughs> I know it sounds cranky, but for me it's the kits. And I remember where I was when I first saw it, which shop I saw it in, and where... But I lived in some interesting places as well, and... Um... No. In the great scheme of things, but they seemed interesting to me at the time. And this is what they do, they sort of transport you back in time. The 109E, another one's got beautiful artwork. Can I separate the kit from the artwork? Because to be fair on this one, the actual artwork is a bit better than the kit is. It's not the best 109E ever. Um, it's okay, okay, that's all you can say. But it's a beautiful art, North African, subject that Airfix hadn't really done, I don't think, at that time. Really opened your eyes to a bit more history that you don't perhaps see as much, or didn't see as much. Not quite as glamorous as the Battle of Britain. So they they even in this kit avoid the Battle of Britain, even though it, it was there, you know. Then we got, in 76, we got the Phantom. I've got, I didn't bother getting the box out, I've got about three of them. But I've got the finished kit here, the Phantom. Uh, with that very iconic artwork where it's diving in, firing its Matra Sneb rockets down on the... Uh, the Scottish practice ranges or the Spade Adam range on the borders with Scotland. And uh, some of you that are sharp eyed may notice something has changed on this aircraft, this model. It's got a coat of gloss clear uh, because I was using it very urgently as pra I've probably gone a bit over the top. I know I have, yes. That's a little bit too glossy for a, an F4, I know what you're saying. Um, and now it's more obvious that there's that missing window. <laughs> between the cockpit and the uh, pilot and navigator here. 
But I know I was doing practice work for my um, Porsche 917 over the shoulder here, which I'll, I'll get into now, but I'll talk about that some other time. But yeah, so I've been glossing up a few of my old Matchbox kits because I was trying to use this Gravity 2K product and get it nice and glossy. But anyway, we digress. But that, that had fantastic artwork and, you know, this is another one of these... Uh, it, that, that was a nice kit because it was one of the Red Range, the bigger kits, so that really jumped out of the window at me. I was so impressed. I had to have that straight away, you know. It has this nice weapons loadout, which some of the Matchbox kits didn't have, which was to their detriment. Didn't have a lot of armament. This one's got everything. It's got the Vulcan, Gatling gun, Matter rocket, Snebs and Sparrows, as well as tanks. So as you can see, that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, something that I really, really enjoyed. Buying, very memorable, lots of fun, you know. And of course, uh, I think the one version where I had it is the Navy version with the raised nose leg and the big ladder at the side. And then, of this collection, I just brought out, last but not least, is the Puma, the little armoured car. I mentioned in my previous video about uh, Jason from Model Kit Stuff. He kindly helped me. He sent me the street that I was missing in my other kit. Well, I've actually got a complete kit here. And again, you know, it's got the very... Uh, memorable window design and, and they've got the dioramas and this is what the thing I was going to talk about wasn't it moving forward you know at the end of the day these wonderful things are of their time and sadly they are gone um, but I want to pose a question two questions to all of you uh, first of all I'd like to hear these are not the best kits that Matchbox made I'm not saying that they're just they have very heavy, heavy memories for me in a good way. Uh, very memory rich, we say, environment. Um, but there was something unique about them as well. You've got these, you know, here's one. We've got the stand, massive stand for the, uh, the Red Range. And this is a couple of things that Matchbox were doing particularly well, better than anybody else. They were doing three things. History on the instructions, as we've seen, where you get a full, the specification, the performance of the aircraft or tank or whatever it was. Then you get the stand, which is a multi-post stand. Uh, I actually glued mine in that particular case because it's a bit of a strange positioning. They didn't quite get the centre of gravity right on the plane where they put the slot. So it had to be glued. But on the, um, the diorama kits, uh, the armour kits I should say, you get the diorama. Now why, why, why? Come on now. You know, at the end of my little odyssey I've done for you here. For you, for me really. I make it sound like I'm doing you a favour. <laughs> but why can't we see a manufacturer who takes on board those three things today? Come on, today. There is absolutely no excuse for this. You can't say it's cost. Cost has got nothing to do with ability to produce a product. You simply price your product to reflect the costs. Now, if you are putting something in a product that makes it more desirable, got to have it then the price, or the cost I should say, for tooling that up is irrelevant. You just price it accordingly and you'll sell the product probably much more volume than you would have done by trying to do it at a price. And I think what's crept into the industry, especially driven by the Far East and the Chinese in particular, I'm not blaming them, I think it's been there before, because AFX have been guilty of this as well. There's this cost plus mentality in business, a lot of businesses, and it's crept into the model world a lot. It's like, how cheaply can we do it for, you know? I and mean, then how much can we sell it for? And there are some kits that are just stupidly overpriced. I mean, if I said to you, okay, I'm going to make an easy target here, but, you know, this um, wing, former Wingnut Wings border model Lancaster, it is a beautiful looking model, you know. It's probably only an 8 out of 10, though. And if you factor in the price, it's probably only a 6 out of 10. Now, I've not had it in my hand. I'm not giving you my verdict. But I'm saying think about it. Come on, come on, it's £600. This is just absurd, absurd, I'm sorry. These kits were 25 pence, these ones in front of me here. And they had more history, they had dioramas, they had stands, they had things that others hadn't thought about that made them far more attractive, gave you more options to display them. What is wrong with the manufacturers today, that, that, and I'm talking specifically to Airfix here, what is wrong with you that you can't see the merits of doing this again? It's not just you. I don't want to pick on Airfix and Hornby group at all, because they have done some good stuff lately, some very good stuff. 
Please have another think about how you move into the future. Instead of rehashing things and just remaking things, try to understand that things were done in the past that are superior in concept to the way things are done today in some cases. And this is the perfect platform for you to look at. I would urge the senior management of places like Hornby, Edward as well, yeah, they're another, Ravel, probably actually in fairness are even more guilty because they've got even less excuse. They've got, they know the value of these diorama kits because they are selling them again and they've now got the cheek to double the price almost and call them first diorama. Why don't we have a first from Ravel and actually start making some new ones, some extra different armour kits with some fresh dioramas and some fresh material instead of just spewing out the old matchbox mould and then trying to make a, a quick book out of it. Why do they not have the vision to see that they would generate themselves a shelf appeal much beyond the competition? I don't understand this. It frustrates me, it really does. People say, oh, it's a car, it's a pr No, it's not. Listen. Listen. Everybody seems to... Everybody. The majority comment and say, I agree with you about the stand. I, Pete, I agree with you about the stand. And the dioramas. Why, why won't they... Well, why won't they? I don't understand. I think most of us that are watching this channel are thinking this is absolutely ridiculous. If it really is. You know, Airfix have come out with some cracking little armour kits in the last two years and they are obstinate in refusing to do this diorama concept. And I can tell you, if I was the CEO at Hornby, I would be instantly, any new tool, I would be at that scale, small scale, I would be, I'd be doing at least two, just, just to see how it goes. Don't overcommit yourself, that's fine, I understand that. I think most of you know as well as I do that if they, if they did this, they would become the de facto number one go-to manufacturer for small armour kits. <coughs> and, you know, these other things about putting a bit of history on, that's just sheer laziness. Sheer laziness. Now, Airfix, in fairness, are one of the better ones in that respect. They are, they are quite good. They like to put a bit of a story on the front. So, again, I'm not knocking Airfix specifically. But let's turn to the Chinese, because they are abjectly appalling at this. They just cannot be bothered. They don't want to employ anybody that, that can write the English for them. How much would that cost? Yeah? A couple of days, maybe a week's work? I could do it. I could do that, you know, like Matchbox did. Bit of research. Two or three days work, day and a half typing it up, job done. A week's work for one person and you have improved the appeal of your kit by about 5-10% to 10 I reckon. It is ridiculous. And the problem is, as long as we go on accepting this, which is wrong in my view, especially when you see them charging, you know, £100, I mean, um, Hong Kong model, um, they weren't too bad in fact, so I don't want to be too harsh on them, but again, it was a bit lucky on the Lancaster 48 skirt, it's a lovely kit. But again, same thing, lovely kit, lovely plastic, fantastic. But they just can't be bothered to do the extra bits that people like Wing Nut Wings did so beautifully. Yeah, <laughs> the best ever. But Tamiyar do it really well as well, they, they come up with a lot of additional material. I've got like Sheridan tank, it's got lots of like additional sheets with it, photographs from Vietnam. Amazing, really good, excellent. So why can the Chinese not do it? Why? Why can they not be bothered? Here's my take on this. I've said this before with people like Border and many, many others. I'm just going to stop buying them. I'm just not interested until they pull their socks up and make a little bit more effort to make the whole kit a package. Maybe it's something that was 25 pence and it was a complete package. Oh, come on. £100 the charging for some of these kits. 90 to 100 pounds on 48 scale. Well, not good enough. Too much money. Too much money, not enough. The value is poor. Anyway, what do you think? Rant over. <laughs> I said in my, one of my previous videos, I think a week or two ago, and I said, these were a complete package. You open it and you get Easter eggs, as I put it. You get these gifts for your eyes, things to read, you know. Um, different markings, bit of history. You know, you get the stand or you get the dioramas. They were fantastic. When you factor in what Matchbox kits cost, they were the world champions of model kits. I'm not saying they're the best ever, that would be ridiculous. But they were at that time, for the money, the value world champions of the model kit world. And we've never seen anything better really, for the money. 
Um, obviously, Wing Nut Wings was a kind of a Rolls Royce product, and they weren't weren't particularly cheap. Uh, but I wouldn't say they were expensive either. They were sort of about right. But matchbooks were cheap. They were very good value indeed, and we just don't get that anymore. Everything's expensive now, and some of these manufacturers simply cannot be bothered to do a proper professional job. So I get cross on that. I know I've turned this into a bit of a rant, which I didn't intend to do. It's really a celebration of Matchbox. Um, the fact that I get passionate about it, I know a lot of you do as well. It, it's just astonishing that, they haven't, that nobody has the vision to see the merit in doing something a bit different. If you just all copy each other, everything becomes the same, doesn't it? Matchbox took one look at the market and said, well, these kits are a little bit boring, really. I'm sure we can jazz it with some better artwork. Let's give them a stand. Let's put a little scene in and make a diorama. Let's give them some bit of history and tell them about the tank or the plane or the car or whatever it is, the ship. Bingo! You get all that in one box. It was astonishing, you know. I think I nearly had a heart attack the first, <laughs> first one I saw. Um, anyway, I think we should round off by saying and asking, which one is your favourite? Not not the best, not nothing to do with how you made it, just overall, what, which one gave you the, the most fun for the money, the most enjoyment? I think I've come to a decision on this, uh, and it's not been an easy one. <laughs> and it's not what you would think, not what you'd think at all. I think the one that I had the most fun with, actually, and it's got a lot of competition, and I think it was this one. I think it was the Mark 1 Harry, and it ain't the best kit. It is not the technically the best kit at all, but there's something about the artwork and the fact that I lived near an RAF base at the time, albeit it was Buccaneers. Um, so I was surrounded by um, a community where there were people in the Royal Air Force, and I had friends whose dads were in the Royal Air Force at school, and you know, they came out with this, it had an American and a British, I thought that was a masterstroke, that, the way that they chose the markings. <laughs> The American and the British version, and uh, as I tell you this tale just at the beginning of the video, I had these great, great fun with my friend Philip, who was the same age as me, so I was about eight, seven or eight at the time, and we used to play with these, and I say, I broke one, I, I think I dropped it, and my dad bought me another one. And I think the second one, I think I did it in the American colours, they could have the AB8A. Um, but it's just, it's the fact that it's rising from the forest, it, ca it encapsulates the passion. Uh, everything that's great about Matchbox is kind of in there, you know. Um, but it's, it's a very narrow winner, it's, it's more to do with the memories it creates, maybe than the kit itself, I've got to be fair. Probably not what you were expecting, it cost 25 pounds. <laughs> what about you? What, what was your favourite? I, I think the close second would be the Corsair, maybe the Firefly, maybe third, or maybe the Hurricane, so hard. I can't, I, I can't give an absolute, <coughs> excuse me, definitive answer, but it kind of bring, it brings back a very nice summer we had in, I think it was 73, um, and it was very dry and warm weather where I was living, and uh, it, yeah, it just brings back a lot of happy memories, you know, playing with my friends in the, the local school, I've talked about that before, where in the schoolyard, it's where they used to film Dad's Army, <laughs> the BBC comedy TV series about the Home Guard which was set in World War II, but they used to come and film it. And we used to play marbles and play with our tank, dinky tanks and harriers, matchbox harriers. And uh, and then on Friday afternoon, we had to be out of there by half past three latest because the BBC would arrive with many trucks <coughs> and they would move in to start filming Dad's Army. And they'd film it from about quarter past half past four in the afternoon onwards during the summer months. That gave them three, four hours, you know, easy of good light. And a lot of these Dad's Army episodes were filmed on a Friday afternoon uh, in the summertime in 73 um, and earlier. Uh, and of course they went on, but um, anyway, digressing a little bit, but it, it, it's just that, you know, I, I look at them and it's like a snapshot, and it's like a photographic memory, bang, I'm seven, I'm playing with such and such a friend or I'm in such and such a place or on such and such a holiday with my family and you just, it brings it all back, doesn't it? <laughs> So, enough of me going on. Much of that, much of what I've just said you've probably heard before anyway, but um, what about you? Tell me, please tell me, in the live chat, please tell me in the comments, which ones bring back the best memories and why? Uh, any bad memories, you know? Um, but which, which are the ones that really, you know, 
are evocative of that happier, fun times when you're a youngster and why. Tell me all about it. Tell me all about it. Anyway, I just want to say thank you to everybody throughout the month who's helped me, as several of you have in all sorts of ways. Photographs, bits of kits, kits, loan of kits, you know, information about kits and catalogues, you know, so those catalogues are amazing, weren't they? It's been very, very enjoyable for me to make this. Um, you know, and I sort of jokingly call myself Mr. Matchbox, but I bet there's a lot of other Mr. and Miss Matchboxes out there as well. Because it's of an era, of a time, isn't it, when we all used to enjoy these things, and uh, the number of times people have said, oh yeah, well, I got a raise in pocket money, so I went off and got promoted to the Orange Range, you know. Or I did my dad's car, washed his car for him, and I got, I got a Phantom or whatever it was. Maybe a birthday present or Christmas, you might get something really impressive like the big Spitfire, the big Messerschmitt, or the Lysander, or Dauntless, etc. etc. Tell me your experiences and your memories. Very interested to hear them. I, I read every single comment, I promise you. 99% with a big grin on my face, I've got to say. <laughs> uh, because it just shows how similar we all are and how much fun these kits brought into our lives, really, as youngsters. Anyway, there we go. I hope you enjoyed the Matchbox March. Thank you very much for joining me. All your time and the comments are deeply appreciated. I, I get as much fun out of reading them as you do, writing them. Um, and, yeah, let's hope that these comments I made, and I know a lot of you share it, about the way that kits are made today. I think that there's, there's a lot of scope for improvement. A lot of scope. We seem to focus all about the moulding and nothing else, and I think that's a big mistake. So let's hope that our passion, all of us, for this hobby, uh, especially for the nostalgia of the Matchbox kits and what it was that made them all so brilliant. Let's hope that some of that can be maybe brought forward into the 21st century by, you know, the Ravels and the Airfixers and the Armour Hobbies and people like that of this world. Um, all who are doing some great products, but just not giving us the, the total package that these did. That they really did. They were just so special. Anyway, enough of me rambling on. Thank you very, very much to all of you. Thanks for your time watching and hope to see you again in the very near future. I've got one or two other things coming up. We're going to talk about the Falklands War. Yeah, it's unfortunate timing. We've got another real war kicking up at the moment, isn't it? But anyway, um, it is 40th anniversary of the Falklands War in April. The start of the war. And one or two other things, a few reviews and things I've got lined up for you. So I hope you'll tune in for those too. In the meantime... Thank you ever so much for joining me and all your time. Look after yourself, stay safe, thanks a lot, and bye for now.